continuing our study in the Gospel of John, we are in chapter 7, starting in verse 14. 7, 14 through 44 is all at the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Lord's declarations are public and clear. Opposition to him is increasingly clear. Now, in this video, in this recording, we'll look at 7, 14 through 24, the Lord's teachings have authority. The Lord Jesus in this passage, 7, 14 through 24, is asked two questions, and he defends his right to teach. They are forced to choose, these listeners are forced to choose, is he the prophet prophesied by Moses who must be obeyed? Think back to Deuteronomy 18, 18, and 19. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him into account. Or is the Lord Jesus the false prophet who must be killed, according to Deuteronomy 18.20, which reads, But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, must be put to death. That is the issue that these people should be thinking about. <laughs> Chapter 7, verse 14. Now, it already being the middle of the feast, Jesus rose up in the temple complex and was teaching. Translated here, temple complex. Iran is this word. It refers to the temple and all the courtyards of the temple. The other Greek word, naos, just refers to the temple building itself. Well, of course, the Lord Jesus didn't rise up and teach in the midst of the naos, in the midst of the actual temple building. No, this is the Hiaran, the temple complex is a good translation. Before this event, for instance, 7-1, and after this event, for instance, 10-39 through 40 and 11-54, the Lord was ministering in quieter places, but at this feast he was teaching in the courts of the temple, which were full of people because of the very popular Feast of Tabernacles. Chapter 7, verse 15. And the Jews were marveling, saying, How can this man know letters, not having studied? According to Morris, the expression, this man, is an insult. The expression could be translated literally just this. We add the word man in order to make a better English sentence. In colloquial English, we might say, this guy. Who is this guy? But they said, who is this, this, or who is this one, or who is this man? They were marveling, but there are some interpretive difficulties here. Perhaps, as Borchert puts it, they, they puzzled that someone who is unschooled in the ways of a rabbi could teach like that. Or perhaps, as per Morris, they were marveling at how unusual his teaching was. Another issue in this verse is, who are the Jews here? Commonly, but not always, in the book of John, the Jews refer to the Jewish leaders. But here, is it the Jewish people? It's hard to know. And the commentator writer Hendrickson explains that the term letters here, the Greek word is grammata, plural, letters, that actually can refer to the letters of the alphabet, like it does in Galatians 6.1. It can refer to letters sent, such as it does in Acts 28.21, or it can refer to the scriptures as in 2 Timothy 3.15. Here it surely refers to the scriptures. Chapter 7, verse 16. Therefore Jesus replied to them and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Now remember this expression that Jesus is the one who was sent by the Father, or the Father sent Jesus. Very common in the Gospel of John. Over 40 times this expression is used like this, like this. And really this exact expression, there are a few rare times when something a little bit like this is used in the synoptics, but really Matthew, Mark, and Luke just don't have this expression. But the Father is the one who sent me, Jesus, in the Gospel of John. Now the rabbis very frequently supported their teachings by citing their rabbinic sources from earlier rabbis. So in good rabbinic style, 
the Lord Jesus supports his teaching by citing his source. But his source, in, in the case of his source, he's not citing a, another rabbi. He's citing the one who sent him, God the Father. Chapter 7, verse 17. If anyone might want to do his will, he will know concerning the teaching, whether it's from God or I from myself am speaking. Often it's translated, he will know concerning my teaching, but actually it's the teaching in the Greek. But we understand. To choose to do his will might mean to believe in him, as in 629, this is the work of God that you believe in the one he sent, in which case he's promising assurance after people believe. However, choosing to do his will might also mean to decide to become a disciple, a follower. In that case, this is much like 8, 31 and 32, where we will read, Therefore Jesus was saying to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, truly my disciples you are, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So, in fact, there are only two possibilities. He is only speaking lies and nonsense, in which case, according to Deuteronomy, he needs to be killed, or he is teaching what he received from his Father. According to the Lord himself, each person who is willing to submit to the will of God will know that he teaches the teachings from heaven and not just out of his own independent thinking or the teachings of man. If he is rejected by many, he is rejected because they are not willing to submit to the will of God. It's almost as if they ask, should he be a teacher? But he asks if they can be students. The condition that we must be willing to do his will reminds us that God the Father seeks worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Chapter 7, verse 18. The one from himself speaking seeks his own glory, but the one seeking the glory of the one that sent him, that one is true, and there's no unrighteousness in him. The one who is speaking from himself seeks glory for himself. Could there be an indirect accusation here? His enemies are seeking their own glory, even to the point of killing him without properly judging him according to their own rules. In 544, he said, How are you able to believe receiving glory from others and the glory that is from the only God you do not seek? However, the glory of God is the motivation of the one who teaches the truth. Chapter 7, verse 19. Has not Moses given you the law? And not one of you is doing the law. Why do you seek to kill me? In verse 18 above, he began to speak about the hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders. In that verse, he sharply emphasizes their hypocrisy. They were very proud of receiving the law from Moses. See 928 for that. Even though the law says, you shall not kill, already there were some who wanted to kill him without a trial. In Romans 2, 25 through 29, Paul also emphasizes the importance of the difference between having and following the law. Chapter 7, verse 20. The crowd replied and said, you have a demon. Who's seeking to kill you? The use of irony again encourages the reader to side with the Lord Jesus. The reader knows he's not demonized and that indeed they are seeking to kill him. As we see in verse 25, some of the people from Jerusalem suspect that their leaders are wanting to kill him, but the readers, we the readers, already know truly there are some, the leaders, that do want to kill him. In verse 25, we read that some of the Jerusalemites were saying, is not that one the one they seek to kill? In, in this verse, the crowd, including many who came from far away for the holidays, they do not yet know about the efforts of the leaders to kill him. John carefully differentiates the speakers that he's recording. For example, the crowd, that's different from the Jerusalemites, and that's different from the Jews, the leaders of the Jewish religion. Chapter 7, verse 21. Jesus replied and said to them, I did one work, and you all marvel. He does not answer their question. 
He did not tell them the identity of each one there that wanted to kill him. But he told of the moment they made their plan, when he healed the man at the pool of Bethesda on the Sabbath. Chapter 5. He reminded them that they marveled. They marveled, perhaps not because it was a miracle, but because he was bold enough to break the Sabbath. Chapter 7, verse 22. On account of this, Moses has given you circumcision. Not that it was from Moses, but from the fathers. And on the Sabbath, you circumcise a person. Because of a command that came before the Sabbath, because the command to circumcise was from the fathers who came before Moses, they circumcised on the Sabbath, a ceremony which did seem to break the law of the Sabbath. Chapter 7, verse 23. If a person receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses is not broken, are you angry at me that I make a whole man well on the Sabbath? If God allows a symbolic need, circumcision, to be carried out even though it breaks the law of the Sabbath, how much more a real need? More than that, circumcision only affects one member of the body, while the Lord Jesus made a whole man well. Their hypocrisy is obvious. Chapter 7, verse 24. Do not judge by outward appearance, but judge the righteous judgment. He makes their hypocrisy obvious, and they are told to reject it. The term judge here includes the concept of differentiating between the true and the false. So in this passage, we have seen part of the Lord's explanation about his teaching being from the one that sent him. And he focuses on their primary objection that he did a miracle on the Sabbath.